weeks away, is that right? The 21st. So, for those of you who are still a little bit unsure about what to do, um, I always advise students to view, um, view, view proposal writing, as, again, as a kind of skill. Okay, It's probably not something you've done too much of, um, and therefore go online again and do, do what I do often, you know, top 10 tips for writing proposals or research proposals. How do you prepare them? You've got the template. Um, so hopefully you've all downloaded the template. You know what kinds of things you're going to have to be writing about as part of your proposal. It comes down to a very basic thing, though. It comes down to you suggesting a piece of research to your supervisor or discussing with your supervisor a piece of research, okay? And common sense tells you that that piece of research needs to have a purpose, okay? It, it, you can't just go, ooh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this because it looks cool, okay? That's probably not going to fly. Uh, and the way I think it's quite useful to start thinking about your proposal, and even sketching it down on a piece of paper with just with a few bullet points and ideas, is to think about the problem that you want to study. Okay, what is the what is the aspect of our world, our marine world, that you are particularly fascinated by and interested in, within the skill set of your supervisor? Okay, so for example, if I'm your supervisor, I study marine bacteria. So they're used coming to me saying, "I've got a great project idea on kangaroos." Okay, because I have no skill set in that area. So I think it's really important to take some ideas to your supervisor that are clearly within the skill set of your supervisor's expertise and interest so that they can um, supervise and take care of you more appropriately. If you are trying to do something which is completely different to the skill set of your supervisor, then I think you'll get a much more difficult time uh, if you try and do a dissertation on something which isn't the expertise of, of your chosen supervisor or your uh, allocated supervisor. So I think that's, it's a really important thing to try and get that balance right. What scientific problem would you like to study that is within the realms of what your supervisor works on and therefore can provide expertise and support on? Okay, so start with a problem. Um, you know, it could be a good place to start might actually be looking at the research publications and track record of your allocated supervisor. What is it that Dr. X works on? Uh, am I interested in any of those things that Dr. X works on? And if so, which aspects of those uh, particular research areas uh, that Dr. X works on am I most excited by or uh, would like to do? Or, again, if you've got your own idea, um, you know, um, I, I'm going to be working with Dr. X, and I know he works on that area. He doesn't currently work on that problem, so I'm going to propose that, that research problem to my supervisor and see if that can work. Okay? So again, it's very important to try and come up with some of your own ideas. So don't just go along to your supervisor and say, oh, what should I do? Yeah? Try and come up with some ideas. And again, you don't need to have them... Uh, expertly drafted out, just some bullet points, some ideas, do a little bit of reading before you go to the meeting and, and discuss those proposals. But the, the, the basic tenet of a proposal is you're going to propose some research and that research should be useful and interesting. It should contribute to generation of knowledge which helps us understand something. Okay? It can either be a basic research project where you're just simply trying to generate knowledge on a topic so that you can understand it better, or it can be a more applied project, like, oh, I want to, I want to grow lobsters more efficiently, for example, or I want to uh, understand uh, plankton uh, in more detail, or whatever it might be, okay? So, so don't be worried by the proposal. Uh, sketch out those ideas in the order with, with which they are presented to you on the proposal form, and I think if you haven't downloaded that form, please do download it, print it off, and have a look at it. And scribble in some ideas, scribble in some rough ideas that 
allow you just to generate some thoughts for discussions with your supervisor. And it will start to come together fairly quickly. Okay? So that's just a few um, pointers um, that might get you off in the correct direction if you're currently involved in that. Any questions, gen, gen, any generic questions about the research proposal? I mean, I know you should probably go to the module leader, um, which I think is Gunter about that, but I'm happy to, to take any generic questions about the research proposal if you have any before we get started on the lecture. I think I'm right in saying that my my dissertation students are meeting you tomorrow. I can't see where you are at 9 a.m., which is good. And we'll talk through some ideas then. Okay. So this lecture is interesting because uh, it's about. Given the size of the room, these screens are a little bit small, aren't they? Can you see, can you see that at the back? So I'm going to talk to you today about electricity production, and in particular electricity production by <coughs> living organisms. Okay. So organisms that can make or produce electricity are called electrogenic organisms, and they produce electricity. And this, this is really interesting because um, about seven or eight years ago, exactly at this time of year, <coughs> an undergraduate student came into my office and said, Grant, I want to do my research dissertation on electric fish, <coughs> electric eels. Uh, and I kind of hesitated and said, well, I don't really work on electric eels. I work on bacteria. And the student looked very, very disappointed and dejected because they had done a lot of reading on electric eels and they had visions of fish tanks down at the Dove filled with electric eels and a whole range of complicated experiments being done on electric eels. So I said to the student, um, Come back in a couple of days and let me have a think about your interests. And I was thinking about combining the ideas that were proffered by the student on electric eels with my expertise. So in the Venn diagram of electric eels and bacteria, where is there an overlap? Well, there is one, which was a bit disappointing to find out. But what I realized when I was doing some additional reading was that bacteria are electrogenic. Bacteria can produce electricity, which I thought was cool and fascinating. So I proposed the project to the student. The student was delighted. We did a project about electricity production by bacteria, and it led to, to a whole series of, of interesting research outputs. So that's just a little example of how you know, some really creative thinking by an undergraduate student combined with uh, some discussions with an academic member of staff can lead to uh, projects which you know, might not have been thought of uh, if it was just the, the supervisor conjuring up a project. Okay, so I want to talk to you about biological production of electricity and in particular the way that microbes can produce electricity through uh, a piece of apparatus known as a microbial <coughs> fuel cell. And how do they work? <coughs> and then again, I'll, I'll keep banging on about one of my favorite subjects, biofilms. Um, these collections of bacteria which have these amazingly interesting properties when they're all stuck together in a horrible slimy layer. Uh, I'll talk about the role of biofilms within these microbial fuel cells. And I'll talk to you about why 
why is your laptop not being powered by bacteria today in 2019? Do we think your phone might be powered by bacteria a few years from now? What are the limitations to translating these scientific discoveries into practical and commercial applications? So I'll talk about scale-up and some applications of, uh, of that as well. So here's a, a, a lesser electric ray. <coughs> North Carolina, Argentina, absolutely fantastic. Um, the Greeks believed that these rays had a number of medicinal uses, including deadening of pain. And the Greek word for numfish, or narc, we get our word narcotic, which deadens pain, which I thought was really interesting. So, you know, there have been applications from many, many hundreds of years ago in, in attempting to numb pain using electrical discharges from electric rays. And this is a really nice um, photograph from an article in Current Biology which shows the diversity and distribution of different types of electric fish and also the uh, electrical output from these different fish is, is very, very different. It's almost species specific. So you can have uh, strongly electric fish or weakly electric fish. And they use the electrical uh, electricity production for a number of reasons. They use it for detection, so almost as a sensor. If you emit an electrical field, then other things around you will affect that electrical field, and that can give you information about the presence of other organisms. And you can detect prey particularly in fairly dark environments, or particularly, for example, very cloudy or murky rivers or lakes where you tend to find these electric fish. This is an extra way of sensing its environment when visual detection is otherwise impaired. Um, the electrical field can be generated for defense, and if you poke or prod many of these types of fish then they will emit uh, very high voltages um, and you know be serve as a very very effective defense just look at the use of electric fences um, by by humans so again this is becoming a bit of a, a theme I guess you'll you'll notice from my lecture series that um, if you go <coughs> back in history and if I say to you, well, fish and, and other things can produce electricity, so what, what, what about things earlier on in the evolutionary, evolutionary journey? And you can trace it right back to the very first organisms on the planet Earth, three billion years ago, bacteria. And one of the nice things about you being here at Newcastle University is that the ability of bacteria to create electricity was a phenomenon that was discovered here in Newcastle University many years ago. In fact, by a chap called Michael Potter in 1911 at Newcastle University when Newcastle University was a college of the University of Durham. So that was cool, uh, and Potter showed when he grew E. coli that it could release electricity when grown on glucose, which was quite a cool discovery. Then key developments in this area were generally quite slow. I mean, it, this is often the case in research. It wasn't until um, 20 or so years later that Cohen started to build fuel cells, effectively little batteries, little bio batteries, living batteries, which could 
allow bacteria to produce um, a fuel cell. And if you connected a lot of these fuel cells together, you could actually achieve some fairly high voltages. So 35 volts in 1931, but importantly, a relatively small current. Okay. Then um, Japanese work in the 70s took this field further on. And you have um, scientists such as Suzuki in the 70s and um, a scientist called Peter Bonetto in the 1980s who took this field forward. And actually, just as an aside, um, when I was your age in the 1980s, I was taught by Peter Bonetto. And he was very keen on this concept because he felt that perhaps we could develop electricity production from biological systems for very remote, very poor parts of the world uh, which didn't already have their own electricity supply. And Pete was very influential in developing that aspect of electricity production. And this is actually um, a really nice uh, paper. Again, going back to... Um, 1983, uh, it's a paper by John Sterling, Peter Bonetto, and a number of scientists from the Biotechnology Group at Queen Elizabeth College, University of London, on microbial fuel cells. And that college, Queen Elizabeth College, is exactly where I did my first degree. I did my degree in biotechnology. I was taught by <coughs> those people. And John Sterling was actually my dissertation supervisor. And again, just as a little bit of an anecdote, I was a little bit disorganized back in those days, and I was very late to put my name down for a project, so I ended up having no supervisor when all the other students had their projects and their project supervisors all tidily be allocated. <laughs> but I remembered why I wanted to go to that particular university. I, I went to that particular university because it was one of the only universities, one of only two universities in the UK, that offered the chance to do molecular biology in uh, 1984, <coughs> where it was just starting. And, and John Sterling was, was very kind uh, when I approached him very late, and I said, can I do a project on molecular biology? Uh, and he said, yes, come back and talk to me in a week or so, and we'll set up a project for you. So it's really interesting teaching you today to see kind of history repeating itself in the development of these projects involving uh, topics which are really quite fascinating. So let's have another look at operating principles of a microbial fuel cell. So again, this is a diagram, and it really just shows you uh, a system whereby you have two compartments of the fuel cell separated by this membrane. One is the cathode and one is the anode. Okay, and the anode of course um, provides electrons and the cathode receives electrons. And that is an electrical circuit with a resistor and you can see that an electrical current can be produced by these metabolic activities of this bacterial cell. Clearly that's not to scale, that's just a very large diagrammatic representation of the bacterial cell to show you that uh, glucose is being absorbed and that respiration is happening and that uh, electrons are being delivered to this electrode. Okay. And those electrons can be received by the electrode through uh, mediators, which are chemicals which will cycle electrons between the bacterial cell and the electrode, by uh, appendages such as pili and nanowires, so again connecting to the end of my last lecture, um, and also by direct contact where protons are provided through to the cathode across the membrane. So that, in essence, provides you with a diagram of how a bacterium connected to an electrode can absorb glucose and, through respiration, give up electrons. Normally, 
when the bacteria isn't attached to an electrode, those electrons will be cycled, and this is quite important, it will be cycled through an electron transport chain, which is part of the apparatus, the biochemical machinery inside the cell, which leads to the release of ATP and energy. Okay? So this is really critical. What we're doing effectively is we're stealing the energy from the bacteria and we're saying, no, 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 you can't use those electrons to make your own energy. We'll have them, thank you very much. Uh, we're taking those electrons into the electrode and they, we're using that energy for our own purposes. So we're using the little bacterial cells as a source of electricity. So the um, bacteria that are there on the anode uh, are very important, and this is where the biofilm comes in. These anodic bacteria can be deliberately added to the system, or we can use mixed species, a mixed species inoculum, and if we do use mixtures of bacteria that are releasing electricity, we can often get greater power outputs from those systems. The other important thing to note is the anode chamber has no oxygen in it. So we're not allowing the bacteria to use up those electrons in respiration which requires oxygen. We're stopping aerobic respiration and we're stealing the electrons off the bacteria. And physically th that compartment can be kept um, anaerobic by sparging it with nitrogen gas. And then what happens if you allow the microbial fuel cell to to basically become adapted, and the, ba the bacteria to become adapted to that process, is that those bacterial communities can develop on the anode, which converts substrates into electricity. And that's exactly what my undergraduate student did all those years ago. Is he, he lived in Sunderland, and he would go back in the evening, and he would always get the metro across the river um, Weir. Is it the Weir that Sunderland is on? And he'd get off the metro, he'd go down to the river, and he'd squelch around in this disgusting mud, and he would bring some of this disgusting mud back to the lab. <coughs> and he set up these microbial fuel cells with some anaerobic mud from the river Weir in Sunderland. And it was all very exciting. So these are examples of <laughs> scanning electron micrographs, photographs, microphotographs of bacteria from different environments. Um, a and B are from a, a, a rice paddy, and C and D are actually from a particular species of bacterium, which is really quite incredible. It's called Geobacter metalli reducens, and it can reduce metal, and it can create lots of electricity, and it's got all these amazing networks, um, which we, we don't know what they are. We think they might be... Um, electricity conducting nanofibrils and so on. But again, if you're interested in this area, go away and read up on Geobacter metalli, metalli reducens. It's an amazing microbe. So this is what they look like. I've told you about the fuel cells. Uh, and this is a sort of diagram of what it looks like in, in, in reality. You've got the anode and the cathode separated by a, a, a membrane. And again, that, that's the, an example of the sort of laboratory setup that you might use if you were uh, working with um, a, a laboratory type fuel cell. Uh, we were able to uh, collaborate uh, with scientists from the Department of Chemical Engineering, Keith Scott in particular, and Keith was uh, an expert, he was a professor of microbial fuel cells. And what was really interesting for me to discover was that if you look across the UK, uh, scientists working on microbial fuel cells, Newcastle is still nationally leading in that area due to the heritage and history of fuel cell research that's been going on here since 1911. 
So it's an amazing uh, phenomenon, and particularly when there's even greater focus on sustainable electricity production uh, from non-fossil fuel sources, then uh, this has immense potential going forward. So this was the work that we published in 2012 with, with, um, with uh, our undergraduate student project. And this is, um, uh, uh, again, a photograph of the anode showing these complex biofilms which were growing on the, on the electrode. And you can see that this is a complicated sort of textbook-like biofilm, again with these fibres and strands holding them together. And this is a slightly more close-up photograph showing this is, a, this is actually a carbon fibre uh, showing the bacteria sticking onto the fiber and being able to release the electricity to that uh, anode. So I've mentioned nanowires in the previous lecture and I just want to uh, give you a couple of concrete examples of organisms which are able to produce um, nanowires. So you've heard of one species of Geobacter already, Geobacter metallic reducens. Here's another one, Geobacter sulfur reducens, which clearly is capable of reducing sulfur. There's another one, really interesting uh, marine bacterium called Schuanella onedensis. Um, which is a genus of bacteria often found in, in the deep sea. And that is also a bacterium which appears to be able to create or synthesize these weird nanowires, which are like electrical conducting uh, protein fibers, the purpose of which uh, we still don't really understand. So examples of bacteria producing electricity, as I've said, they're called the exoelectrogens. And they include other genera, such as Bacillus and Clostridium. And what's important is that these bacteria tend to be able to produce different amounts of energy, different amounts of electricity. And so we published um, this work in Environmental Science and Technology, Enhanced electricity production by using reconstituted artificial <coughs> consortia of estuarine bacteria grown as biofilms. So we took bacteria <coughs> from the river Weir and we set up microbial fuel cells with them as part of our undergraduate projects. We worked with Keith Scott, we worked with um, a chap, a, a lecturer called Enren Zhang, who was visiting from um, Yangzhou University in China. So this was an international collaboration. And we set these microbial fuel cells up with Sunderland mud. And the project all went horribly wrong because no electricity production was produced by this system. So we had it connected to a little voltmeter, zero. Come in every morning, we look at this fuel cell, zero. And this went on, somewhat depressingly, for about three weeks. And the student was getting very, very concerned. I've got no results, I've got no data, what am I going to do about my dissertation? And finally, after about three weeks, the electricity production by the microbial, microbial fuel cell started very slowly to creep up. And it was really exciting coming in each morning, a little bit more electricity, next day a little bit more, next day a little bit more. And what was happening here was that the bacteria were growing and evolving. And it took quite a bit of time for this community of bacteria to grow up on the anode and start to create electricity. Take home message from that is Research is very difficult. For those of you about to embark on your own research project, it's very different from a lab practical, where we set up things because we know they work. You're about to set up, uh, start work on a dissertation. 
uh, doing research, doing experiments, generally things go wrong. Okay? Things break, things don't work, and it's important to be resilient and not to be uh, defeated when things go wrong and, and, and don't work. We always keep trying and keep pushing on, try and overcome the various hurdles that will arise. So this was a really great study. We sent it to this journal, the Envir uh, Environmental Science and Technology. It's a very high quality journal. It's published by the American Chemical Society. Um, and we were really pleased to be able to get that published. And one of the things that we found was that the different bacteria, this table represents an immense amount of work. We were able to isolate lots of different bacteria from the river weir, and I appreciate you can't see it at the back there, but what this table shows is it shows you a table of different strains of bacteria that we isolated from the mud from the river in Sunderland that had been growing on the anode. So we're thinking these bacteria that are on the anode now in the microbial fuel cell, they're producing the electricity. And the question was, which ones? Which bacteria are producing electricity? So we isolated 20, 30, 40 different strains, and we set up, we purified the strains, and we set up 40 different microbial fuel cells with a single species in each one. And we separately measured the electricity produced by each strain of bacteria from the original electricity producing community. It took about a year. Hum humongous amount of work. And this was carried on um, very, very carefully, very, very thoroughly. And what was very, very interesting at the end of the day is that quite a lot of the bacteria that we isolated from this community were not producing any electricity whatsoever. They were just there. They were just growing. They were just like hangers on. Okay? Quite a lot of, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15, 20, 35 strains of bacteria not producing any electricity. On the other hand, some bacteria were producing very high quantities of electricity. And in particular, that strain there, strain MS10. And again, I'll read it out because you won't be able to, to read that. The species that was producing all of this electricity is called Bacillus stratospherecus. And the other one was Bacillus altitudinus. And we discovered that by doing 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So what is this organism, Bacillus stratospherecus? What does the word stratosphere mean to you? What does stratosphere mean? Where is the stratosphere? Anyone know? <coughs> it's the upper atmosphere. Right? It's a very high atmosphere of the planet Earth. It's almost where the atmosphere doesn't exist anymore and it becomes space. So that part of the upper atmosphere is called the stratosphere. It's miles and miles above the surface of the planet Earth. And it turns out that this bacterium had been found before by scientists who had sent up these weather balloons into the stratosphere and collected air samples and studied bacteria which are present in the upper stratosphere. So here was a very weird discovery that we were finding these, um, these bacteria that are normally found in the stratosphere in a river in Sunderland, and, and more importantly, that they were capable of producing particularly high levels of electricity. So we were not content with growing our own slime from the river weir. We wanted to make it more efficient, so we threw away all the strains which weren't making electricity. And we, we hand-picked strains which were very good at making electricity. And we reconstituted five or six species into our own designer slime. This was our own designer biofilm. We had made this biofilm by plucking five or six species together, mixing them up, 
and pulling them in our microbial fuel cells. So this was us engineering some slime. And what we d then did is we then looked at the production of electricity by our designer slime, and we showed quite clearly that electricity production could be enhanced, perhaps obviously, if you throw away all the bugs which don't make electricity, and if you use the bugs which are great at making electricity. So this was a really nice study where we had looked at a system, we had understood it, we had put it back together again, and we had made an improvement uh, in the power output of our microbial fuel cell. So that was... Um, uh, we we uh, published a press release on this paper, um, and uh, the media got a little bit carried away, uh, and they were sort of calling it things like... Um, you know, electricity from space slime and things like that, which wasn't really true. And I had to deny on a number of um, news outlets that no, it wasn't, you know, slime from outer space, but it was actually bacteria that are normally found in the stratosphere, which is very different to, you know, alien life, because the Sun and some other newspapers wanted to write about, you know, alien life producing electricity. Um, so there's a number of, of, of links on that. Um, it went a bit viral, if you could use viral in that time of year, in that year rather. Um, so yeah, have a look at those later. Okay, so coming back to my key point about why we're not powering all our phones and laptops on slime today. Uh, clearly, that's not happening. Clearly, the technology is not yet ready or available to use <coughs> Uh, although I'm fairly sure it will become in a usable form soon. So let's have a look at limiting factors. So if, one, if the source of the energy is, is, is a nutrient such as glucose, then clearly a limiting factor is where you get those nutrient sources from. Not only is it a limiting factor, it's an economic factor. Are you gonna, are you gonna manufacture some sugar cane and then buy some sugar cane at you know, 200 pounds a tonne and then you're going to put that and feed that into bacteria and try and get some electricity out the other end. How expensive do you think your electricity will be once you've done that whole cycle? Too expensive is the answer. So why don't you take nutrients which were somebody else's waste stream, uh, brewery waste as an example. If you're a brewery, you've got lots of nutrient-rich waste. You have to pay to get it processed so that it doesn't clog up rivers. So scientists are looking at turning waste streams into electricity. And then actually, it turns them into ele electrons plus carbon dioxide. So it removes nutrients from waste streams, and instead of a pollution headache, you get some free electricity at the end of it. So those systems are being looked at. But the key problem here is the rate at which electricity can be produced across that electrode. It's a very uh, inefficient process, and one of the ways in which you need to scale up is to improve the surface area of your electrode. And that can be done instead of using concrete, uh, sorry, instead of using solid electrodes, you can use folded uh, carbon cloth electrodes, for example, which can significantly boost the surface area of your electrode. So those two things are being done. Now, Newcastle University, in another very exciting development just over this summer, Newcastle University, in collaboration with Northumbria University, have been awarded, I think, about £10 million to develop novel bio-buildings. All right, you think, well, what's that? Okay, so what we're doing here with the School of Architecture is we're looking at buildings of the future. If we know that waste nutrients can provide electricity, why don't we build that into our, our houses and our flats? Why don't we have systems within every home that take waste and turn it into electricity? Can we use septic tanks in rural areas to power homes? Can we develop environmental sensors in marine sediments, which can take nutrients from sediments, create electricity, 
and then send information about the seafloor to uh, a, re a receiver. So importantly, and probably the area which is going to take off the, the quickest, is fire remediation, that is cleaning up our waste. So we're not producing electricity for the sake of it, but we're using it to drive reactions, to detoxify chemicals. And a good example of that is converting soluble uranium into the insoluble form. So we're taking something which is a bit deadly, we're making it less deadly by putting it through a microbial fuel cell. So it can be used as a catalyst for bioremediation as well as a system for providing electricity. Now here's a, a really nice example of a marine microbial fuel cell. This is data from 2007. And what we see here is that we've got mud and we've got electrodes in the mud, a data acquisition system, and then electrodes in the, in the, the water above the mud. And that, if you look carefully, is all of the components of a microbial fuel cell. So you embed the anode in the sediment, and the maximum power output of that particular system was 4 milliwatts per meter squared. So proof of concept it shows that this is possible. Can we develop better marine sensors based on microbial fuel cells? How constant is the electricity production? How reliable are they? Well, as with any new technology, the first versions are often expensive and unreliable, and technology and engineering needs to be applied to make them more reliable and less expensive, which is what engineers do. So um, Bruce Logan is a, a, a prolific uh, scientist working in this area. So uh, this is an, another example of work from Logan, who looked at electricity generation from a particular nutrient called cysteine in a microbial fuel cell. And he looked at bacteria um, producing electricity. So this is the power output versus the concentration of nutrient. Perhaps, obviously, as you increase the concentration of the nutrient, the power output increases. And this is with a species of Schuonella and using marine sediment as inoculum. So it wasn't just Chewinella. These scientists looked at which bacteria were present using DNA analysis, uh, and they found that Chewinella was one of the most dominant species present. But they didn't culture and isolate that bacterium, and they didn't demonstrate how much electricity was produced by those isolated species, as we did in our work. So this raises the point about analysing bacteria, but without growing them. So we grew them. It was very laborious and very time-consuming. And a quick way of analysing bacteria is to use so-called culture-independent analysis of bacteria. And you can examine cell morphology. You can stain them by uh, diamidino-2-phenolindol, or DAPI. Some of you might have come across DAPI if you've been reading about fluorescence in situ hybridization. And you can look and detect bacteria using staining procedures like DAPI stain. That shows you the bacteria that are present on the anode. So culture independent analysis is a very important aspect of looking at bacteria on the anode. This is a nice one. Uh, this is taking your urine and turning that into a power source. Imagine some of the uh, bars and clubs in Newcastle could produce thousands of watts of energy, I would imagine, given some of the activities that go on in for said institutions. So fixed nitrogen, you remember we talked about fixed nitrogen, where nitrogen gas is converted to ammonia by the enzyme nitrogenase. So fixed nitrogen are uh, fertilizers, and these are very important and very costly to produce. Urine is effectively a liquid form of fertilizer, and wastewater treatments often have too much nitrate, for example. Too much fertilizer is being used, it gets into the rivers, the farmers use too much fertilizer, and the rivers get um, uh, too much 
nutrient in them, and they get uh, algal blooms grow in them, for example, and that can cause problems. So this particular work I'm showing you here, and which I referred to in that water research journal, aims to recover fixed nitrogen from human urine. And this was the setup. If you had a structure like this, which is a two-compartment system, we've got one system which is effectively a pipeline, and that has an anode on the left covered in bacteria, which serves as the fuel cell anode. And then we have um, a membrane which allows gas diffusion, and we have air and ammonia going through there, so the influent, all the, the, the urine and water goes into the anode and the ammonia diffuses across into the cathode chamber through gas diffusion <coughs> and the ammonia and air is removed from the system and is driven by this electrical microbial fuel cell. So you get electricity and ammonia from the system. So that's a kind of really uh, interesting example. And again, you know, if you look at the dates on these, these were like five, six, ten years ago. Um, and what I'm seeing as well is these systems which scientists were looking at ten years ago, nobody was really interested in them. It was all a bit hippie. Oh, yeah, you know, electricity from we, that's a bit hippie, that's a bit boring, and actually it's very expensive, so we're not going to bother. Today... I think people, as you, as you probably know yourselves, around the world are a lot more um, interested and excited about these processes because they provide electricity using sustainable waste. And those processes are a lot more at the forefront of our thinking than they were you know, even a few years ago. This is a really nice example of a cyanobacterium. Again, they're all connected, all these discussions. Cyanobacterium, it's a filamentous cyanobacterium. Um, Anyone name a filamentous cyanobacterial genus? Definitely going to have to bring in some prizes. Oscillatoria is one, okay, which I mentioned in previous lectures. This is a filamentous cyanobacterium. It could be oscillatoria. Now look, it's exactly the same situation as the microbial fuel cell that I showed you a picture of earlier. It's a long piece of filament, and it has an oxic layer and an anoxic layer. It has an anaerobic section. And can you see then that the, the situation of a microbial fuel cell is present? And so that that single cyanobacterial filament can act as its own microbial fuel cell. And we can have electron transport, electron transport across the body of the filamentous cyanobacterium and it can then obtain energy from that electron electron cycling. In that case, of course, it's converting the energy into biomass production and growth, because nobody's there to steal it from the cyanobacteria. So, um, again, I've given you an overview of the Venn diagram of electricity and biology, and I've shown you that it's a fascinating area of science. You know, electric fish in, in rivers in South America through to the discovery of electricity production by bacteria here in Newcastle um, almost 100 years ago, or over 100 years ago, in fact. And the fact that we still serve as a centre for expertise in that particular area today. And more importantly, that we, Newcastle University, are the first UK university to receive such a significant sum of money to develop these incredible bio-buildings of, of the future. And it sounds a bit weird, you know, going home to your flat and, you know, in the future what's going to happen? Is your, is your flat going to be covered in a biofilm on the wall? Or, you know, is your kitchen going to be powered from your, your wee or your, your feces? Or what, what is it going to look like? Um, are, you, are the bricks on your house going to be full of cyanobacteria? generating electricity for your house. What, what is it all going to look like? And that's what this research project is about. So, um, it's important, however, to keep things in perspective. This is still very much 
I would say R&D, research and development, rather than translation and commercialization. But again, if I was to predict or make any predictions, I would say that there would certainly be businesses, companies, startups and spin-outs uh, in this particular area of technology in the coming few years. So there's great potential with, um, uh, for combining electricity production with purification of water. Uh, marine sensors is an area to watch. Uh, but as I said, it's important that we look at the technical challenges which remain and keep an eye on how those technical challenges are being addressed by scientists and engineers today. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. And again, I hope to ask, answer any questions. Yeah, cheers.